Okay, um, apologies from me. I've got one of those glorious 16 inch MacBook Pros uh, and every time I turn it on something new and exciting happens. So the, the webcam broke uh, not long back. Uh, I managed to get that working and then the, the touch bar broke uh, and then the webcams broke again. So you're not going to get my uh, lovely bearded face to laugh at. So it's just unfortunately just audio. Um, I've got, an, <laughs> it's more of a, a, a whiny gripe set of slides than, than an interesting one. So I'm not going to be going into anything with with Go, although there's some, some other code is certainly written in uh, certainly written in Go, but it's more of navigating automated without a map. And I'm seeing lots of interesting things. So for those who don't know me, I work for Juniper Networks. I recently transitioned into the software team as a, a software portfolio architect, and I've got a lovely title of product manager director. Um, it doesn't really mean a whole lot other than now I get to make some scary decisions and really screw things up. Um, so moved over into this space with, with quite a large amount of field experience helping customers transition through their, um, I guess, kind of natural life cycles as they, they pick up new technology. And some things have become really like blatantly obvious in terms of what's going wrong. Right, and those things are all related, unfortunately, to graph, graph, graphs, and, and more graph. Um, if we think about traditional network engineering, where we take some, so this is not gonna be cool, by the way, there's no, there's no software-defined networking, there's no OpenFlow, there's no P4. Did I just say OpenFlow? I think I actually did say OpenFlow. Um, this is grassroots engineering and grassroots problems that I'm still seeing. So if we think about networking on the whole, we take switches, routers, and, and firewalls, and we try and stitch together some kind of uh, notion of a service. Now, whether that's end-to-end -end for an internal customer, uh, so whether that's an internal on-premises DC, whether that's kind of some WAN solution, whether it's physical service chaining, who cares, whatever it is, it's nothing more than, than a graph of stuff. And you can look at it as, as a physical thing. So physical boxes tied together by physical interfaces. You could look at it as logical. So logical ethernet kind of instances running on, on physical, uh, physical ports with IP families configured on them or, you know, kind of ISO families configured on them. It's still this kind of set of, of graph relationships. Um, and I'm kind of seeing a lot of, of the automation efforts they, they kind of focus on this problem uh, of graph by not doing anything with a graph it's let's generate configuration per node and throw the configuration at the node and hopefully things stick together so what you're seeing on, on the right hand side is just a, a screenshot from a new 4j uh, library of, of, of images and i'm going to show you some some 4j later on actually as well um, and what i'm kind of working at in the background and what i'm hopefully kind of push and evangelize and also maybe this will lead to a product in the future I can't, can't really say but I'm certainly doing the work on that is to get us to a point where we can model um, generic systems in, in a topology way so I don't I don't just mean physical I don't just mean uh, logical as in BGP peers and IGPs and all these other different things I mean the whole system end-to-end -end in this kind of bi-directional set of bindings and instead of doing a horrible data model traversals where we try and link things together through config, what if we could just ask questions and, uh, and iterate our way through the kind of the data that we need to do some, some interesting things. Now, we could look at automation as well in terms of something called a label transition system, which is basically a way to model a finite state machine. And again, it, it's a graph system. Uh, even the basic thing we do, if we take the three kind of boiling, um, you know, the ingredients to boil together in a workflow, which is being processed, so go do something, do that thing cleanly and come back with data. Um, it's iteration. So go around in a loop and, and kind of exhaust a set of variables that we need to take information from, or even just in, use them as an index. And alternation is making if else and then statements to go off and, and make decisions in terms of what we what we think we need to do based on the data we have at hand. Um, all of those things go into a structured program, i.e. the graph. Um, but also then to use that graph in, in order to to move a network beyond its state so we can talk about dangerous things here if we want to bring like a bgp pair up and um we forget to advertise routes one end comes up advertises routes another end just receives but does, doesn't advertise anything back we can end up in some really weird positions where, where we've caused some kind of like asymmetry um in a network so we, when we have this this issue as well around kind of consistency around the edge so we need to make sure that we can uh, reliably do these things um, and I just don't see a lot of systems kind of taking this into account. It's kind of lessons to learn from an engineering perspective. Uh, anyway, it's graph, 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 and I'm just not seeing the problem um, being solved. So workflows, we can call them DAGs or directed acyclic graphs. 
they have a start point, they have an end point, they generally flow, flow top down if you're thinking about them from a, from a design point of view. And, and they're designed to ultimately move one or more systems through a number of different state transitions to get to a, uh, a, just a moment in time desired state. And I don't want to say an end state because networking is never in an end state. It might be in an end state for an hour, for a day, for a week. But the end state, until the, either the business is um, destroyed by a meteorite, it's sold or, or whatever, I don't think that there's an ever an end state that these, these systems go into. Um, and workflows, when they're mechanized, and what I mean by mechanized is when we take a human process, we, we make it machine friendly to load onto a workflow engine, um, they come in two real distinct flavors. And one of them is product automa uh, productized automation. So we could say ACI is, Cisco ACI is a really good example of this, where we have controllers to interact with the system and you get a constrained number of choices. So this is opinionated and kind of productized automation. And then we also have um, Contrail. Uh, and Contrail gives you a set of uh, opinions as well to do um, or to carry out your desire but ultimately on Junos devices. So we actually have a box that a human can interact with and we're trying to push that thing into a, into a known number of states. Um, but then we have the, the kind of generic workflow engine concepts. And, and this is kind of different. So if we start off on, on let's say, wildly on the left-hand side with very opinionated and productized automation, which drives these devices either in a visible way or a kind of like a, a semi-invisible uh, way, like, like the, the Contrail versus ACI comparison. Um, and then we go, we flick over to the right hand side where we have this kind of generic workflow engine. One requires that you consume and use, and the other side requires that you have the ability to create these workflows and understand what the hell it is that you're trying to do. And, and the end to end, the design thinking approach, you know, like we, we talk about blast radius a lot in network automation. So we could say blast radius of one, and we could say, well, from the DevOps world, we're going to go off and re rebuild a web server, get it into a known state, and insert it into a call for load balancing. Um, great. So we have a blast radius one if we change some um change some things on that server it's probably not going to go anywhere else with networking and our distributed kind of fabric of compute we, we don't have that problem we have a potential blast radius of n we change one thing and, and all sorts of carnage could be could let loose and without having a model for that we have no idea that the end state or let's say the the, the moment in time end state that's going to happen with these things um, one requires a huge amount of skill, the other one requires a huge amount of, of, of consumption and frustration. We get frustrated that the, the productized aut automation products don't do everything that we want to do. It's like the snowflake problem. Um, every network has got a, a fixed number of points, but the pattern's different in the middle. Um, and, and the middle ground here is, is kind of a little bit a little bit iffy. And um, just to be legendary, my neighbors just started on his drum kit, so apologies on that. All the windows are closed. You're still going to hear that. Um, so my frustration massively is... Um, we're kind of like poking around in the dark with product automation, a productized automation. There might be elements of graphs. So I know ACI has this whole service graph piece, but in terms of the whole system being able to query and be assured of, of the manipulations that we're making, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I know Contrail also doesn't doesn't have those things. From a generic workflow engine point of view, we can now build workflows in a very structured programming and oriented way. We can take all the stuff from you know from Dijkstra from like 70 years ago and still do those things today on, on a, on a well-known workflow engine. Um, I just don't see the thing in the middle which allows us to be sure of what it is that we're doing. We're doing point in time, fixed point set of directive uh, kind of deployments to individual nodes, hoping that they go to this point where, that we can imagine, um, not that we can measure very well. Uh, so I know myself and Matt Oswalt have been and done an INOC talk before around network reliability engineering. The things that we're doing today, you know, you know I kind of I fear uh, in terms of the reliability aspect. It's all still very much hope, and I'm not seeing the industry doing a whole lot around this. Um, and to just get a bit of a measure of where we are, and this is not me knocking Ansible, by the way, or robot for that matter, I'm just trying to give you a bit of a, a bit of a ready retina and apologize for any automation experts. This is probably the, the most boring part of the talk. Um, Ansible has helped us to do some really interesting things. We've now got the notion we can list tasks together um, and we can also deal with things like uh, determinism uh, and indeterminism within the workflow. So with Ansible, we can start the thing off as a once completion script with enough input variables to complete the job. So we can say that's deterministic. And then we can also go indeterministic where we might be able to get a task that goes up and queries an external system and registers that data within the um, kind of the execution run for further use down the line. So in a, in a kind of squint your eyes kind of way, we could say it's a CAS system or a complex adaptive system, but let's make um, no mistake about it. The, the kind of Ansible approach and it's very limited set of language makes it very difficult to, to do some, some more complex things with. It isn't domain aware. It doesn't have any bindings to being um, 
a domain aware tool. It's all down to the, the skill of the human operator to build the workflows and to mechanize it and to make it suitable for what, for what it is that we're trying to do. We generally hope for the best in, in these situations. Um, shortly after this kind of blind, let's consume a template, throw some variables at it and throw it at a device, um, we had test frameworks come along. So we go, oh, well, let's reuse a robot test framework. And I know Juniper internally, it's no secret, uh, our devs team use robot with, with thousands of keywords. So when they go off and make a Junos code change, they, they can test for that. And we can stand up BGP sessions and, and measure for the number of routes uh, that a system might generate within a lab. So robots are used by, by, by us even quite extensively. Um, so then we have these notions of pre-checks and post-checks. So even if we stick on the Ansible theme now, we can make sure the system doesn't have the things that we're trying to ask it to do. We can do the thing and then we can measure to make sure it's there. But even then it's just at a management plane level and very rarely does anybody deal with CRUD. So creating is always the first thing everybody does. Read back, mm, I don't see that a lot. Update, certainly not. And deletion, um, I don't see a lot of kind of CRUD thinking around this. I just say really see this as a as a C way forward, create and worry about the rest later down the line or pick it up as, as technical debt. Um, so really kind of where we are as, as an industry is we take some human readable templates. We take kind of host uh, information. So this is our access information in terms of how we get there, maybe what port we need to connect on and on, on what protocol, which very much relies on the southbound plugin for the tool. We take the variables to go into the templates um, and then directives so they could be tasks within the playbook or, or whatever, depending on the tool and obviously the parlance changes. Um, and I've kind of put the troll on here because it feels like we're doing something really insane. If you stand far enough back at this and you look at it through, say, like graph theory or automator kind of theory, push down automation, all these different things, it kind of feels scary. We, we, we generate all these human readable blobs of stuff and hope by, by chance that it works, that we've actually got the information from the right place. Um, it, it's kind of eerie. So we start off. Uh, in a in a pre-state without our desired kind of uh, directives or intent being on those devices. We might run one playbook to get the base information on there. Some devices care about ordering, some don't, depends, uh, it, it all kind of relies on at atomicity and, and this, this whole transaction notion. So we might have to stand the IP address information um, on the ports first and then uh, allow that to, to, to self-commit, whether that's explicit or implicit, and then we can stand the BGP session upon that. And then what I was talking about earlier on about this whole um, eventual state. So if we, if we want the network to be in this state, we've got a BGP session up, we've got two sets of routes being advertised and being received, and that requires some coordination. And, and unfortunately, if we move beyond tools like Ansible into product uh, productized automation, then we end up with all this fragile code and all these if else statements in terms of making sure all of these things are done in a very, very hard coded manner. Um, so we, we could break a complex task down into several stages to, to make sure things are done in the right order, things are testable. And then at the right time, maybe a maintenance window comes along, we stand up these sessions, uh, interfaces come online, both routes are exchanged and bam, we, 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 can, we can kind of move on. But it just feels, it feels very, very blind. Uh, and what I mean by kind of, I think I said model traversal earlier on, what I mean by that is we might have some schema information for the devices which might relate to a database or uh, an Excel page, an Excel page, an Excel worksheet, sorry, where we get things like port information from. And then what we end up doing is we index into different data models to kind of get the, the respective uh, parameters. So if we take the BGP information on the right hand side here and we go onto the top device and um, we might blindly just configure the IP address and the interface. We might do a check and say, well, if there's no configuration here, you know what, I'm going to consume it and I'm going to put a reserve tag on or something in, in process um, tag. And then I'm going to go to the other box and do the same thing. And when I bring both interfaces up, what I'm expecting to see is the interface goes operational at, at point A and point B, but they're independent tests. There's nothing that ties it up from, from the perspective of the tool. And I, I honestly think this is kind of a bit crazy. Um, gone backwards there. So it really kind of grinds my gears on this. It, it really gets on my nerves that there's this explosion of automation and this explosion of enthusiasm uh, around automation. But I see a huge amount of shortcoming when it comes to being kind of sticky to the domain. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm really fortunate to work for a company that allows me in front of, of so many really um, great customers. And I'm, I'm sure I spoke to some of you in the, in the past. Um, I, I just, I, I can't, I can't celebrate where we are, it, it, it's, it's kind of painful. Um, if we think about workflows and arbitrary workflow engines, we have to put a significant amount of work and have to build, um, 
build con consumables for the workflow engine to get it to do anything interesting at all. Um, but if we go to the productized automation aspects, we expect these kind of mind reading products uh, that, that take every thought out of our head and every desire and whim um, and, and give you a click point menu to go and do these things. And the middle ground where it's applicable to networking and, and meaningful, uh, I think is, is completely missing. But you know what's missing? Yeah, it's a graph. I'm not gonna say the swear words behind it, but we're missing a system, uh, a bi-directional set of bindings that allow us to do some, some more interesting things and be confident in terms of what we're doing. So what if we could go off to a different system and ask it for, the state, uh, for a set of relationships? So if I go back to my really terrible diagram here, and let's pretend on the right hand side, root, this is router A. I want to know what the, the neighbor relationship is to router B. Now, this might have been done at onboarding, you know, as the device is onboarded into a system, LLDP or something might have been turned on, some neighbor discovery, and then the ports were shut down again. So, this also obviously helps to do things like cable validation uh, to make sure things are connected where they think they're connected, because that's just another huge industry problem that doesn't seem to be um, massively dealt with. But if we could go to that system and ask it for things, we wouldn't have to do this kind of awful model traversal. Um, and we can remove humans one more step away from, from screwing things up. Um, so we're missing, in my kind of humble and honest opinion, a, a graph to be able to do this. Um, and every tool is heroic in its own right. And I'm, I'm not going to bash any of the tools. Every tool will help us to take steps forward. But one of the huge steps forward that, I'm, that I'd love to take, it just isn't here and I end up kind of recreating the wheel every, every single time. Um, but it's in, in its own kind of snowflake way, every tool tries to usurp every other tool. And whether it's um, a kind of commercial uh, or love for open source, we've accidentally made them pets in our own brain. Um, you know, now they're special, we've got to do something with them. Um, but ultimately, we're trying to make DevOps still fit bottom up. So if we go back to the blast radius thing um, and I'm going to mess around with a web server and try and put that in a pool. Um, taking some human configuration for a web server as a config, uh, bringing it up as a service, checking that I've got a PID that's been uh, returned or a PPID and, and even doing like a port check. I've got a keyword I can detect on the page before I put into the load balancer group. Great. Okay, right, go. Um, that works really well on the kind of the blast radius one situations. On the blast radius N, if we carry on going bottom up and we go to each individual device and make these kind of almost blind changes on the hope that they do what we want to do. Um, I don't think we're going to, we're not going to get very far before kind of more things go wrong. And I've certainly seen a lot of failed efforts uh, around this. We have to think about our domain, which is, it's not special, but we're in networking. We're not in these kind of blast radius one problems. We're in blast radius N, which requires a different set of thought. Um, I'm again, going back to my employer, I'm, I'm really fortunate to, to kind of be let off the leash and have some really, really great conversations. And what I see is I see devs being, in a silo and I see ops being in a silo. I see dev creating say productized or automator if it's certainly in the case of Juniper. These, uh, these devs, they, they've never gone off and operated a network, you know, shock, horror, uh, surprise, surprise, that they've never gone off and, and done this stuff. And the ops team, uh, a lot of them have never been in development, although they can write scripts, but writing scripts and software are two different things, like being mechanically sympathetic or empathic to your kind of surroundings is something that uh, a lot of devs don't necessarily do unless you're a, a very kind of skilled or domain focused one. Um, and an ops, they don't really under, understand. Again, I'm, I'm tarring people with you know, a great big brush here. So you know, forgive, uh, forgive me because there are the odd, the odd ones that slip through. But if, if we can go from the top, we have to bring these two groups together. Um, there's, there's lots of kind of famous stories during the rounds and all sorts of misunderstandings how systems work. So there's an educational piece, and I know Matt touched on this with, with the whole network reliability engineering piece when we were in Ireland. Um, skills and education is still massively important. We have to understand what our device offers us or our network offers us in terms of programmability. Um, but we only really get further uh, when AI I can stop swearing about this and just kind of beat my own head against a brick wall. Uh, and the panacea is when these two teams come together and, and both deep dive in terms of knowledge share. So what's actually described to these um, kind of devs, how things actually work in, the, in this blast radius N kind of problem and how we also need to be um, kind of distributed compute people. We need to go off and um, gather data from multiple nodes and have wide net uh, graph assertions on things to see um, if our changes uh, are accurate, if they're, they're going to result in exactly what we want instead of the, this kind of hope and pray 
Uh, and this is also not to mention um, every system we take a physical modular box has got multiple layers of software. So we've got a network operating system uh, which comprises of software demons and services. Those demons and services talk to micro kernels, which then live on line cards. Uh, even the, um, the kind of backplane and, and fabric cards have all got their own software on. Transceivers have got their own software on. The MPUs have got their own code. Uh, in addition to all things like the, the micro kernels. So then we've got this kind of probability game. So even if uh, our directives are received by, um, by the actual networking device itself, there's no guarantee that any of that's going to make it down to the data plane. We, this is why testing or um, unit tests at the management plane is great, but eh, not that important. If we can go all the way down the stack and have this kind of bi-directional set of graph bindings that, that actually reassure us that what we're doing uh, works, not only would it make the approach to automation meaningful and compelling, people are always asking, how do we make automation compelling? What do we do with telemetry? You know, give us an example. Well, the example is, is the big wide end-to-end -end picture. It's not just take a single use case and do something with it. Unfortunately, it's kind of like a cultural change uh, on top of all these things as well. Um, and more kind of grinding gears and more swear words. Where are we as an industry? I think we're in a really pretty bad place right now. Um, we have no way of going from say uh, a parallel would be in electronics um, where we can take transistors and capacitors and resistors and LEDs and all, all sorts of things and diodes and whatever um, and draw out a circuit. You can look at this and go, well, I think that's a flip flop. Yep, the LEDs are going to flash and then whatever. And looking at, I, don't, I don't know, the components haven't got timings for the capacitors, but it's going to flash, it's going to do something. We don't have any other way. I mean, what, what we turn on and say, oh, we're going to use a tool um, and we're going to do some automation. And then you know, everybody rejoices and celebrates and whoops and high fives. Um, and it's kind of embarrassing. We, we don't have a really good way of doing this stuff. Um, we've got this, this draw into uh, Python and Ansible as a default starting point. So before any of the workflows are understood, um, before any of the, the actual desired uh, end state for control, and obviously not the end state of the network, but the, this kind of the notion of what it is that you want to do and the controls around how you want to get there, the tool choices have already been made. And then there's many complaints that come from making those, making those tool choices. Um, how do we get from, from this pretty appalling state really uh, to something much more meaningful? And I'm hell bent on, on doing this through kind of graph ops. Um, I don't want to add on this ever to be a thing. I'm, I'm just saying graph ops here because it's just for the sake of brevity. Um, but we take something like a, a configuration tool. So obviously we have to generate configuration, whether that's through imperative means and API calls, whether that's fiddling around with uh, like an SDK for the device or creating ephemeral configuration that doesn't, doesn't survive boot time or in fact, you know, manipulating the data stores on devices. We have to, we have to do that at some point. Um, OpenFlow did it through the controller and we replaced directives through an abstraction onto the chips but whatever that kind of died for various reasons so let's say we have a graph configuration engine we create relationships of things that build a service or build a an amount of configuration this isn't a mono config either so this isn't everything we might have a golden configuration in place taken care of by ci cd pipeline um, but we might have this graph configuration system that gives us this this idea and notion of services and then um, we need to make sure then that how we overlay that graph onto the onto the devices um, is, is possible. So without this without this kind of uh, operational graph, we end up just kind of hoping and praying that we've done enough CLI checks um, that, that allows us to move forward with the confidence. But what if we had this graph? We could actually go off and say, okay, interface. Um, I don't know, whatever, Ethernet 000 on, on route A, tell me about your neighbors. And if it comes back with none, we can go, ah, great, it's free. So then we go off to, say, an inventory database, we mark it for a particular use or a particular customer. We go to the other side and say, hey, tell me about your neighbor. Or you might even retrieve from the graph like a cable check when that was when that was when last time. You might even rerun that for that particular set of pores. It's going to be a non-destructive change at that point. Um, if we could go and ask these questions, so as my phone ringing in the background, that's always really nice. Um, we can then overlay this, these kind of elements, uh, these kind of composed uh, sets of, of graph directives onto each node and be really, really sure that when we get to the point of hitting commit, that everything, all the pieces are there uh, to allow us to move forward with absolute confidence. We can ask so many kind of different questions. We can even make sure um, that BGP ASN is, is in fact there, the process is on by going making these really, really simple graph queries. We don't have to jump between different kind of textual models that we have or invoke them. We can go to the graph and make some really simple, um, some simple calls. And, and it's great as well. So if you imagine a much more complex scenario where you have several routers in a mesh 
and you want to take a route out for maintenance, what you might do is you might want to query the state of the router um, that is going into maintenance. You might say, okay, router, tell me about all of your neighbors. And then what you do is you set out your uh, IGP to have maximum metrics. You go all to the, to, the, to the neighbors one hop away and you set maximum metrics on there. And then you monitor for drain. Once you've drained, you go and shut things like BGP down if you're doing anything like that really gracefully. You should interface it down gracefully. You, you might upgrade the node. And then you go back on. You don't have to go off and hope and pray or hard code anything for these particular workflows. The graph becomes massively, massively powerful. Um, some interesting things going on in this space then. Um, I'm pushing really hard inside Juniper to get some Terraform providers built for all the major platforms and all the major software versions, probably from kind of version 14 onwards up to the latest releases. So that'll include things like MX, PTX, SRX, EX and ACX and all these different platforms. That's sitting with engineering right now. So we're, we're getting quite far with that. We've got a, a, a kind of a, an alpha on um, NRE labs, but NRE, um, the, the Terraform tool gives us this graph configuration engine. We get to create these relationships. Ordering isn't important, uh, especially for Junos because it, Junos sorts that out for us. There are some vendors that don't do that. I'm not gonna get into that, it's not about that. Um, but we have this kind of graph configuration tool in mind and, and how we're gonna do that. What we don't have sorted out is this kind of graph ops system. And this is something I'm, I'm looking at either internally is building it either out as a product and I'd love to get feedback certainly from this community. And I'm not, <laughs> I'm not here to, by the way, to get that before you chuckle and think ah, damn vendors are all the same. That's not what this is. Um, or open source it. Cause I think this is kind of more interesting um, open source than, than obviously being a product. So what you see in front of you, I'm, I'm actually in development right now, I'm building some the inventory system, at least to do the, the inventory discovery and get all the relationships built into place. Um, the next step is to go one logical entity up and then map things like services, what's been activated, uh, and then, then put directional bindings in. So the second we change something on the graph, it invokes a call to southbound systems, which go and places that information on, onto the devices and also with synchronization as well, hopefully. So I'm, I'm saying a lot of what ifs here, but um, I want to just share something with you here as well, that this is really quite useful. Uh, let me just drag this screen over here and come back down. That's marvelous. Um, what I mean, by the way, when we can query. So here I, I've got a really, really simple query. I've gone off to a device or gone to an MX. And I basically asked it to give me the, the neighbor relationship for Ethernet 201. And what you get back is you get a table, you get a table of information back, um, but it's a set, effectively a set of nodes and a vertex uh, with information, the, exactly the information I return from the query. So I can use that in some kind of algorithm. So we go to a central place, I get the relationship data I need to be able to make those decisions. Uh, and then it means I can action them. Um, and I'm just gonna show you this, because this is, this is pretty reasonable. Uh, these graphs can get pretty noisy and, and pretty big. Um, but this is say a, a real life model um, right now of map devices. But it, imagine getting to a point where you can query for all of your BGP states, whether they're up or down, um, whether it's eBGP, IBGP, whatever. How does your IGP look? Being able to go to this graph and, and query this stuff, you're still a human, we can still understand these things. And then as we get the information, we make it meaningful, we normalize it, we make it domain specific. So this is notice this, this is all domain specific information. Um, we can provide tools around the edge of a system like this to make it, um, to make it more useful. Um, so that's kind of my rant. I guess that's where I am right now. I'm putting a huge amount of time and effort into this from a product management point of view and also from a uh, kind of a, a sponsorship and, and social aspect. I'm really keen to hear from anybody who thinks this is interesting. Uh, if you think I'm smoking crack, in which case I'm not, but um, the, the view is probably valid. Um, feel free to reach out. And I just want to say thanks for that. And thank you, obviously, to the organizers for inviting me along. Um, this has been the first time I've done this for any kind of a group uh, remotely through Zoom. So. Um, yeah, thank you. And uh, over to you, to the organizers.